Alright, let's roll. The fuck? Oh yeah. I remember now. Have you been run over by a Tesla on autopilot and need legal counsel? Hi, I'm Jenks. If your hands still work, call me for legal counsel right away. No, fuck. Are you straight on the outside but gay on the inside? Do you daydream of getting your by another man while you're in bed with your wife? If so, you just need straight away a once a day pill. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Jenks here from Queers and Steers. I hope everyone had a Merry Christmas. I ended up going back to Indiana for Thanksgiving, got COVID, and so I decided to just keep my ass in Atlanta. My 36 month lease is up. I already called the dealership here in Atlanta to go turn it in. It's the 26th today, Tuesday, and I am turning it in on Friday the 29th. If you've been watching my videos for quite some time, you know that I have loved my time with the Polestar, the car itself, however, the service experience has been less than stellar. So I thought I would give everyone who might be interested in a Polestar 2, maybe you have one, maybe you bought the launch edition like I did and you're just curious how other people are feeling. This video is to give you all of the good, the bad, and the unacceptable in the last three years. Here we go. All right, let's start with the good. As much as I hate to say it, I have more bad things to say about my experience with the Polestar 2 than I do Oh, excuse me, I just ate a bunch of peanuts. More bad things to say than I do good things. Now, the first good thing about the Polestar is the performance. It's zero to 60 in four and a half seconds. I hit those numbers myself. It's quick off the line as most EVs are. I've never struggled to pass anyone. In the days when I first got it and I was racing people at stoplights, I always win the race. But I'm in my mid thirties now. I don't really fuck with that anymore. It's an EV. It's a, it's a performance oriented EV. Mine has the performance package with the bigger wheels, the Olin's dampers, stiffer suspension. So I knew what I was getting into. Most EVs are quick off the line and you're gonna get what you pay for. The next thing I love about the Polestar 2 are very functional, for the most part, interior and exterior design decisions. The slim side view mirrors are sleek and functional aerodynamically. The kick to open closed trunk is useful and surprisingly not on the new car I bought, which I will talk about in another video. The wheels on the performance package are, in my opinion, the best factory wheels I've ever seen in a car. Y'all can debate me in the comments if you want to, but when I saw this car's release in the performance package, I just fell in love with the wheels. I splooshed for the wheels, hands down. I honestly love the native Android automotive operating system. It's clean, it's crisp, I love the color choices. Albeit in this model, I think the chip is a little outdated. It's a, it's a little slow to run certain functions, especially now when I start up the car. It could definitely use a chip boost, but for the most part, it hasn't really affected me in the day to day. I love that inside the trunk, it has that little pop-up holder with the strap for grocery bags. The initial build quality is really good. I would say now three years in, there are some things that I noticed. The seat belt holder has a little rattle. There's a little creak coming from the trunk, but overall, I think compared to other cars I've owned in the past, and especially Teslas that I've driven in for <laughs> with Uber or Lyft, hands down, night and day difference from build quality's concerned. There really, really is a lot to love about the design. Chef's kiss. Sadly, those are the only things I love about it. <laughs> now we're gonna get on to the bad. And this is, uh, again, a comprehensive list. Some of these you might love, some of these you might've experienced and thought that you prefer them to other cars that you've owned. But for me, three years into it, I just, mm. I, I lived with them at first, when I first bought the car. A lot of these things I was, aware of, some of them I weren't, some of them were promised by Polestar, but they didn't deliver. Either way, for me, these now in the next car that I purchased, wink, 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 are features that are non-negotiable for the most part. The first, the fucking cup holder situation. Again, this is one of those things that I knew about prior to buying the car. So you have one cup holder that's visible at all times. If you have somebody else in the car with a cup, you have to open up the center armrest 
to find the second cup holder, which is removable, which I guess is fine, but I think it just goes to show how little care they put into it that they built in one solid cup holder into the car and the other one is just a little plastic removable thing. So if you drive with two people with two cups, you're not gonna be able to rest your arm anywhere, which is super annoying. Everybody was complaining about this when the car was launched. It's super frustrating, but not a deal breaker. I usually drive by myself, so it's fine, but it's annoying. Next, the ride quality on the performance tires. Now, again, this is a conscious choice that I made when I purchased the vehicle. I knew that I would sacrifice ride comfort for those sexy wheels that I talked about earlier. After buying a big cushy SUV now, the ride quality difference is just night and day. Again, that was a conscious choice that I made, but I think it's something if ride quality and, and comfort is something that you are, that takes precedence for you, I would highly suggest just for going the performance package, I believe it still costs $5,000 on new models. And honestly, unless you're paying for that because you want the sexy wheels like I did, you can just completely forgo, save the money and get one with either the 19 inch wheels or maybe the 20s, but get smaller wheels you'll get more range out of it as well. Forego the performance pack if you don't care about the looks. Listen, when I first got the car, it was all about racing people at stoplights and driving down twisty roads in Los Angeles when I lived there. Now I'm in my mid thirties and it's time for comfort, babes. I don't have time. I don't have time to race people, especially here in Atlanta because motherfuckers cannot drive in Atlanta. I need to, I should make a whole separate video about how people drive here and how fucked up it is. It's crazy, but Atlanta, y'all need to slow the fuck down. The next thing I don't really care for is the mobile app. I was in the early camp of it always working for me. I never really had a problem with the app with the exception of when I first bought the car, I went to a park, I only took my phone with me. And then when I tried to leave, the car just didn't recognize my phone. I had to get an Uber back to my apartment to get the fob and drive back before the park closed. Luckily it was fine. And that's the only, that's the, that's the only time that I ever had an issue. But also because of that instance, there weren't many instances where I felt comfortable leaving without a key fob and just taking my phone with me. If I were going on short trips around Los Angeles, but anything further than a couple of miles away, I just never wanted to risk it and I always took my key fob with me. The app now is redesigned. It has a much cleaner look than the, when it was first launched, but I even tested it today. The lock and unlock functions work okay, but when I tried to start the climate, I did it twice. It spun for 60 seconds and then I got an error message at the bottom that said the car wasn't connected to the internet, try again. I don't charge at home. I don't have a charger installed in my house yet. That's gonna come later, probably after tax season. So I'm always fast charging. So I can't test the schedule function. I clicked it just to see if the button worked and it lit up right away and said scheduled for 7 p.m. So I can't speak to whether or not the actual charging works when you use that, but just wanted to say. For a luxury brand, I expected more from the mobile app. I just do. And something to keep in mind about Polestar's mobile app, it is not Apple's sort of digital key functionality where you can have the key in the wallet app or share it with other people to use your car without the key fob, which is really sweet. My new car has all of that. Polestar's app is based off of Bluetooth and GPS. And the only way to use your phone as a key is to have your location turned on at all times. It doesn't drain the battery too much. I think in a day it's maybe like four or 5%, which isn't insignificant, but it's not enough for me to care. And frankly, because I never really use my phone as a key anymore, because I just don't want to get in a situation where I'm stranded anymore, I actually just turned it off and stopped using it because I always had the key fob with me anyway. But again, for a 65, close to $70,000 car, I would expect them to now run on ultra wideband technology for the digital key from Apple. And I hope that perhaps the Polestar 4 Maybe, I mean, the Polestar 3 is coming out sooner, but the Polestar 4 was the one that was in my price range in eyesight. Maybe one of those cars will have the ultra wideband functionality and allow you to use Apple's digital key. But for now, for my Polestar 2, it does not have it. Nor do the current 2024 Polestar 2s. The next thing I don't like, the charging curve. They improved this since I first purchased it, but even up to 40, 50%, the charging rate drops from 150. So the, the maximum for the car is 155. I've never seen it get up that high, even at a 350 kilowatt charger. It usually sits around like 145, 147. 
But then it seems quickly after, like even once you get to like 20, 30 percent, it just starts dropping, dropping and dropping. And I charged last night. This is going to be my last charge before I turn it in to Volvo Polestar. The charging curve just isn't as competitive as other products, especially with BMW, Hyundai, Kia. Those just charge and stay at a high rate until 70, even 80%, whereas the Polestar seems to drop off as early as like 30%. I know this is a three-year-old car, but even then it wasn't really competitive compared to other Korean brands like Hyundai or Kia, even BMW. So it'll be interesting to see how the Polestar 3 and the Polestar 4 charge when they're released. The other thing I wanted to mention about charging is you cannot manually precondition the battery. Again, I knew that when I bought the car, I didn't really care. When you input a destination in the native Google Maps in the Android Automotive system, it automatically preconditions the battery for you. That's never really been a problem, but for people who prefer to use CarPlay, you would have to exit out of CarPlay and then go back into the Google, the native Google Maps in the car, punch in your Electrify America or your charger address and do it that way instead of using the app on your phone. And you can't actually tell when the battery is preconditioning because there's no identifying icon or blip that tells you that it's preconditioning. The next thing I don't like is Apple CarPlay. Now, if you are an Android person, just note that the car doesn't support Android Auto. The reason for this is because the car runs native Android automotive operating system. And I guess Polestar just finds it redundant to then plug in your Android phone to then replace the native Android automotive OS with the mirroring of Android Auto. Something to keep in mind if you're an Android user. For Apple CarPlay, when the car was announced, it was promised, and I use that word lightly, that Apple CarPlay would be wireless. If you go back to the forums back then, if you look at some of my videos and comments, it was supposed to be wireless. In the middle of 2021, Polestar announced that it had to be wired due to circumstances outside of their control. I don't know if that control is because they just didn't install the right hardware in the car. That would be my guess because if they promised it, but then it didn't work, why wouldn't it work? There are some speculations out there on the forums. If you want to go read about it, go ahead. I'm not an engineer. There are probably people who can explain it better than I can, but I just wanted to mention that I bought the car with the expectation that it would have wireless CarPlay and it ended up being wired, which sucks. It's 2023. I mean, I bought the car in 2020, so I can somewhat forgive Polestar, but I rented a, a base level Chevrolet Malibu from Hertz recently when my Polestar was in for service for like three weeks, other story. And the Chevrolet Malibu had wireless CarPlay and it worked really well. So I don't know what the fucking problem is, but I'm waiting for automakers to step it up. The next feature I don't like is no heat pump. Now, when I bought the car, it was in Los Angeles. I didn't need one. It, the coldest it ever got in Los Angeles was like 40 degrees. But here in Atlanta, it makes a pretty significant difference. And so when I'm charging the car and using the heated seats and running the heat on low, it says my usable range is 120, which seems really low. I know that includes battery degradation over three years, but 120 miles on a full charge when the car was rated for 200 to 10 when I bought it is not insignificant. Again, I want to emphasize the newer model Pulsar 2s do have a heat pump to reuse some of that energy that normally would have been lost to heat the cabin. That's really going to help with your range. And so if that is a factor for you considering buying a Pulsar 2 now, you wouldn't have to worry about that if you're buying a new one. The next thing I don't like, the back seat space is pretty cramped. Now, surprisingly, I tested this earlier today. I'm six foot. The seat was set up for me. Knee room, fantastic. Foot room, it's a little cramped because the seats are low to the ground. Even head room is not that bad, but it just feels, it feels really tight. When you get in and out of the back seat, your leg and foot kind of hits the, the, the base of the, the, the vehicle where the door closes. It just feels like usable space is like okay for two people, but I think for a road trip longer than 30 minutes or an hour, you would just feel pretty claustrophobic back there. And then the last thing I don't like about the Polestar 2. Mm. Why? Why don't these extend? This does not block any fucking sunlight! All right, now we're about to get into the ugly, the nasty, the what the fuck is going on. 
I've talked about both of these ad nauseum in my previous videos, but again, this is the three year wrap up, baby. You all need to know the truth of my ownership experience. Here we go. The first absolutely unforgivable piece about owning this car are the defective Olin's dampers on the performance package. If you've seen my prior videos, you've seen me talk about this. The Olin's dampers in the 2021 Launch Edition Polestar 2 are defective. They're defective. Every six to eight to 12 months or so, I've had to take my car into Polestar for them to lubricate the shocks because they were for some reason just built incorrectly or the way that they sit in the car just aren't right and they require lubrication every few months. I have taken my car in for the shocks to be lubricated gosh, at least five times. I have all the paperwork somewhere. If you're curious to see all the paperwork, I'm happy to like dig through some boxes and find it for you. But just know that not only have I taken it in five, maybe six times for the dampers to be lubed, they've had to keep the car due to supply constraints, etc. for collectively, I think now I'm at like a hundred Oh God, it has to be more than that by now. I would say between 100 and 150 days in the last three years, they've had to keep my car for the dampers. Now this included them at, at the beginning when they didn't know what it was, they replaced them a bunch of times. They just lubricated them. I think in the last the last couple of times I went, they've tried a mixture of both. I don't know what's going on with these dampers, but my understanding is that the newer models like 2022 and beyond either have it fixed don't use the Olin's dampers anymore, or it's been alleviated, but it is something to consider if you are thinking about buying a used Polestar 2 launch edition that is three years old. I would completely ignore and avoid the performance pack model on the 2021 launch edition if you're buying used. Honestly, if I had the time and the energy, I would have filed a lemon law claim. Like in the state of California, which is where I was, having to take it in I think three, I don't remember what the actual lemon law is California, but it absolutely surpassed the lemon law. And the amount of times that I reached out to their customer service to discuss it, of course, they're not just going to give me a new car. Like they're going to make me get a lawyer and all of that. And honestly, maybe I should have, but I work a full-time job. I'm tired. I don't have time for all that shit. And honestly, I knew I was giving the car back. So like they can just deal with it. If I weren't leasing the car, I probably would have done it. But since it was a lease, I didn't really care. But you really need to keep that in mind if you're buying used. Oh, baby. And now the last thing that is unfucking forgivable about this Polestar 2, which is, again, they're saying are competing with Porsche. The unforgivable thing, the service experience. Every time I've taken my car in for service, they've given it back to me in worse condition. Admittedly, I've had a ton of tires replaced living in LA because I've had to drive through alleys to get to my garage. I've driven through so many nails in LA, it's fucking stupid. So I've had tires replaced. Every time I've had tires replaced, they've scratched the rims. I am so OCD. If you look at my car, I mean, I've done some, some walk arounds already, but like my OCD, I park so far away from people, from curbs. I use the 360 view, like, I never let anything happen to my car, ever, period. So to bring it into a certified Volvo Polestar service center and to get it back in worse condition every time is unforgivable. Scratched rims, there's been grease smears in the door panel, not from me. Most of that was in Los Angeles. Here in Atlanta, ooh child, after I moved to Atlanta, the car was not accelerating. It was making crazy noises. And so I took it in and I guess something with the rear axle came undone. And when it came undone, it like penetrated like a battery module or like the, I don't think it was the battery itself. I think it was like a control module or something like that. And so they had to fix it. The first time this happened, they gave me a rental from Hertz. It was the Chevy Malibu with wireless car play that worked extremely well because they didn't have any electric cars. And so again, they kept it for a couple weeks and they fixed it. Now, when I drove home, the entire car was like swaying side to side. And I thought, is this me? Like, it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like gaslighting myself. I'm like, is this the wind? Maybe it just needs to like settle. It's a tire. Like, I don't really know. And then I'm like, oh wait, the alignment's off too. Maybe it's the alignment. So I ended up turning it around and taking it back. And they're like, oh wait, your frame is bent. And they were like, they didn't know what they were doing. Like I, 
kept my car here in Atlanta at the Volvo Service Center. I'm not gonna call them out here. If you're curious, I guess I can message you. Maybe I should call them out here, but in any case, that's not the point of me telling a story because both Polestar Volvo dealership service centers that I've been to both in LA and here in Atlanta have been horrible. So the cost of repair, luckily all of this was under warranty, but I took a snapshot of the cost of repair of this. It would have been over $10,000 if this were out of warranty. When I reached out to Polestar customer support to explain all of the things that I'm telling you right now, I said, I want to talk to the head of customer support. This is beyond anyone else. I want to talk to them. So somebody reaches out to me and they weren't the head of customer support. And when I asked them, I said, well, who's the head of customer support? What's their name? They had to look it up. They did not know who the head of customer support for their own company was. So I'm like, okay, let me tell you what happened and blah, blah, blah. Like, what are you going to do? And of course it was just lip service, right? Like they probably called the Volvo Pulsar space and well, what's going on and blah, blah, blah. And then again, I work five days a week, nine to five. So I'm busy. This person who initially called me, called me back a few times and left voicemails and they forgot to hang up the phone. One of the, they forgot to hang up the phone. They didn't hang up the phone. So they're leaving me a voicemail and she's talking to her colleague who's likely sitting next to her. And she's like, well, I can't get a hold of him. I'm probably just gonna close this case out because you know, he's just not responsive. Again, this is a two minute voicemail on my, I, I have it right now. I have, I'm not gonna play it cause I'm recording on my phone, but I have this voicemail. And so finally I do the NPS CSAT survey for this person and I'm like, dear Polestar, here is what happened. Your associate left a long voicemail. I heard her talking about me. This service center keeps fucking up my car, which by the way, the Atlanta service center, when they kept fixing my car, it ended up not being fixed in worse condition. So I had kept having to get a bit back. And then when I asked for paperwork, they didn't want to give me paperwork. Like uh, they, the first time he made an excuse, like, oh, well the, the guy who was working on your car isn't here. So I'm locked out of the system. I'll email it to you. Both times they were like trying to deflect and not give me paperwork. And I still don't have paperwork for Either of the two times I brought it in to Atlanta for this crazy wobbling axle shit, they just didn't give me paperwork, which to me is likely a result of their inadequacies and them fucking it up and they just don't want receipts of their own poor service. So after I typed up this long CSAT survey, the head of Polestar, her name is Barbara, left me a voicemail. And by the way, when I left that little CSAT comment, I was like, you know, I want to talk to the head of Polestar. Don't contact me or talk to me if you're not going to offer me financial compensation, first in line for the Polestar 4, like give me money back, considering you've had my car for three months, like maybe you give me three months back on my payments. If you're not going to do any of that, don't call me. And so again, while I was working, I get a call from the head of Polestar customer support, Barbara, who leaves me a very empty voicemail not offering any of those things, just a very empty, like, hey, I saw your CSAT. I wanted to apologize. Call me back. No, I'm not going to call you back. Maybe I should have. So that's the Polestar 2, three years later. Now, what are some last words? I was really, really excited to be an early adopter. I remember watching the keynote. I was screen recording. I was taking pictures. I was putting people onto it, driving around LA with the, like, literally, I think I was the maybe second or third person in Los Angeles to have it and stopping at stoplights and people waving at me, me sitting in coffee shops and like watching people go up to it to look inside and taking pictures of it. It was fucking cool. Like it was a cool fucking car and everybody wanted to know what it was. And I always spoke highly of it. Like I wanted the Polestar 4 so bad. The Polestar 4 looks incredible, but ultimately the awful repair and customer support experience completely tainted my view of the brand. Service is abysmal. It's not worth the mental anguish for me. So Polestar Volvo, I implore you to get your customer service channels in order so you know how to talk to each other. Whether you're going to invest in the existing Volvo repair centers so they understand and know how to repair Polestars, or you're eventually gonna have the capital to open up your own repair centers that are specific to Polestar, whatever you're gonna do, you need to focus on that simultaneously or before, I would say before, you keep making these gorgeous new cars because if you're making gorgeous and designing gorgeous new cars but you can't fix them because they will break, 
Volvo, reliability, hello. You've got your priorities fucked up. So what does this mean for all of you? Should you buy a Polestar 2? Honestly, if you're looking for a sexy EV that not a lot of people have, get the 2024 model. If you're okay with the potential for what I've gone through with this service. The new model has a heat pump, which helps with range. It still looks sexy. You can actually get a single motor model that charges at 205 kilowatts the dual motor is still limited to 155 kilowatts but keep in mind the 2024 model as compelling as it might be it still doesn't have wireless apple carplay you still have to deal with the shitty app and there is still no extendable sun visors and lease deals are starting at 349 for the polestar 2 the 2024 model which is Pretty compelling considering I got my new car's lease. Granted, the MSRP is significantly higher for a lot more than 349 But you also have to consider the Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Kia EV6. Hell, even the Cadillac Lyric has a more premium package and better charging than the Polestar 2. So you have to decide what you want. Polestar, you wowed the world with a compelling product and unmistakable design but your brand is tainted by the incoherency of the service centers and the slow to act customer support. You had and lost a fan. But I'm still gonna wear this hat cause it's a good hat. That's been my three year recap of the 2021 launch edition Polestar 2. Vroom vroom skirt. Take care.